Hello everybody. We decided to post this talk on my website um, after I gave it two times this um, spring, first in San Francisco at Photo Alliance and in February and then in March um, at Turner Carroll's container space in the in the Santa Fe rail yard. And it's in honor of st having started the um, wastewater garden in the Mesopotamian marshes of southern Iraq and to kind of interweave my artwork or contextualize, place my artwork in the center of this um, project. So I decided to call my talk Land at Risk, with land as a, both a noun and a verb, because the focus of my recent work has been about the intersections of nature and culture in places where my country has been at war, most recently in Iraq. I want, want to show you a little of older work to put the newest in context. In 1988, these were my four stages of home, um, these are my four stages of home, the loved one's body um, on the bottom, the Zuni Pueblo's place of emergence, that next rung. If you think of this as a ladder and move up through this ladder with the loved one's body at the bottom, and then the Zuni Pueblo's place of emergence, their salt lake. And then the third rung is an everyday back porch with a nest, if you live out in the country, as many of us do in New Mexico, and the top is a radio telescope phoning home to the stars. Since establishing my studio in Santa Fe in 1975, I've evolved from photographer of single photographic images to environmental artist of extended photographic works, multimedia installations, and social practice. I've worked mostly um, in New Mexico for the first 20 years, that is, but now I leave the studio frequently to photograph, research, and teach. Here I am at the Temple of Inanna in Mesopotamia in 2014, and again at Mount Bromo in Indonesia in 2010. As an artist, I address issues of war and peace juxtaposed with nature, who I think of as an enduring and thereby healing force. But what if she's no longer able to protect us? Throughout my work, there's been an underpinning of myth and ritual, which I explore through materials. My first teachers were the lowriders in 1980, 1980 in northern New Mexico, whose use of velvet, chrome, sandblast, sculptural, kinetic details evoke ancient rituals of, of the religious procession, and whose velvet, sensuous, vulva-like interiors paired with hydraulic jumping reenact the ritual of procreation. In addition, the lowriders are always aware of the ground, tierra madre, in which they cruise low and slow. The first tang tangible war intention I encountered was during the Manhattan Project in New Mexico, now the site of the Los Alamos National Lab, where the making of the first atomic bomb in the 1940s occurred in close proximity to San Ildefonso Pueblo next door. There's a palladium print from that work. And here um, you'll see my collaborators, a wonderful performance artist, poet, videographer, Ellen Zweig, and Sain and Woody Vasilka. And here I am um, projecting, here's the fat man, one of the three casings for that bomb that did fall on Nagasaki. At the, and here it is, the third one's at the Bradbury Museum in Los Alamos, um, where they allowed me to photograph and project slides onto it. Oppenheimer's chair followed the critical mass work. It was commissioned by the first site Santa Fe Biennale, which opened on the 50th anniversary of the first atomic blast at White Sands. Here you see a ghost tree sandblasted in the rear of the house, trying to reclaim its broken landscape. Each of the four parts of, on the video, of the video on the chair, each part opens with a slingshot being fired and closes with a snake sh shedding its skin. Um, an armored figure guards the house. A trans it's a tra giant transparency. I worked in Vietnam from in 19... 97, 98, and two, no, 98, 2000, 2003, and I became interested there in the difference in the Western and Eastern body in response to aggression. And so as you can see with um, um, Oppenheimer's chair and the armor in the West, we think of bodies as very, you know, protected, hard. But in the East, they're fluid um, after centuries and centuries of war and Buddhist practice. And so I made this work on transparent vellum In 2000, um, I went back to Vietnam and um, started a, a, the, a project called Millennial Forest, in which two enemy forests um, look at each other 
and I was examining the differences between the two cultures that had faced each other in time of war. In Vietnam, so what you see here are three trees, and in the center is the queen tree from Vietnam, on the left a temple tree from Hue, and on the right that's our bristlecone pine, the oldest dated tree in the, in the U.S. But in Vietnam, the oldest trees endure because they are taken care of and protected, while in America, the oldest trees survive because they're too difficult to find to cut down. And here's some of the work. Um, so uh, what you're seeing are two Vietnamese trees on the left and two American trees on the right. And what the process, I, I invented a process called, which I call preamber types, where digital vegetable inks are printed on mulberry tree bark paper that's coated with gum arabic and has dissolved ground mica powder, either gold or silver. I made these these um, images with a five by seven view camera with black and white negatives, and learned at this point how to render color. So it's it's men, women made made up color. Um, so, um, and then just one other point about this is that in, in 2000, the inks were, were liquid, they were dyes, so that I created a coating that was hydroscopic where the dyes could migrate into the coating and be much more dimensional than, than sitting on the surface of the paper, the way um, printers off, um, inkjet printers do. So here's how they were. In, the trees were installed on your left. There's two enemy forests facing each other, and in between. So if you think of the trees as vertical, and you think how we cut them down, and they become horizontal for boats. And here, um, I, I use these antique boats to show to have portraits of people who had changed sides because of the war. Here's a cover of, of my book, which you can find on the website and download as well. So after this work, I. I embarked on a 10-year project called Eden Turned on Its Side, um, which consists, um, in 2009, consists of three distinct bodies of work. Um, here I can tell you photosynthesis. So um, there, it was a trilogy, and the first part was about photosynthesis, which you can see on the lower right, um, leaves. And the, the, the second part was the volcano, volcano cycle, here on the lo lower left. And then the top part shows you Eden in Iraq of the work I finally did in Iraq. So with photosynthesis, so with the, with all the work, and, and even turn on its side, time is addressed on three separate scales, um, human time, geologic time, and mythic time. So in each section explores post-edenic relation. I should post I scanned leaves from the three places I was living, Singapore, Vermont, and Santa Fe. Um, and so this was this, the UNM, UNM exhibition was curated by um, Dr. Sean Michelle Smith from the Chicago Art Institute, who wanted to be the first one to show all three parts. To, and and um, so here, human beings interact with nature over the course of a full year as they experience the spring and fall equinoxes. Um, let me just see yeah, here. This is the spring and fall equinoxes, summer and winter solstice. What about that oxygen? that source of oxygen on a polluted planet? We breathe in to survive and out to feed the rich, feed the tree. In, for, in return for our carbon dioxide, this to me is, is an, the symbiotic relationship is so Edenic. So I learned from volcanoes. So I should probably say here that I could do have these three parts going on because I was living in two different places in, at that point, well, three different places, but I was teaching half the year in Singapore and, and then was able to be in my studio in New Mexico and also caretaking a family farm in Vermont. So um, I, so while I was in Singapore, I, I began to work with volcano volcanologists along Indonesia's Ring of Fire. And what I was after was the primal power of learning about the primal power and majesty of Earth's geologic forces. Um, and so here, wah, 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 here, um, Kawaijin, Bromo, two of the most amazing places. The prints were on metal, prepared aluminum. So one of the first things I learned about and what got me interested in working with volcanoes was from a colleague's office, a volcanologist, um, Chris Newell, where he had this toba dust in his office. This I'm just photographing on his desk. And po toba was a volcano that that blew in Malaysia 74,000 years ago. And when it did, it created a, a volcanic winter that either extincted all of us or many of us. And so uh, scientists tend to call, scientists have called the Toba eruption the weak garden of Eden because things had to start, start over.
In 2010, I learned, of, I learned that the historic Garden of Eden was thought to be in southern Iraq. Um, and here the Mesopotamian marshes are flanked by the um, Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which cross on its east, eastern edge. So I, once I knew that this place was the Garden of Eden, thought of as the Garden of Eden, I added this third segment to Eden turned on its side. Um, I simultaneously added... Oh, so what I want to show you here are the marshes, but below I want to show you above these, this portrait are, is this drawing. Um, I simultaneously added the Environmental Remediation Project, Eden in Iraq, um, and so here's the drawing of our wastewater garden. I also started to teach art and ecology at the University in Singapore, and at this point I, I knew that I wanted to leave something constructive behind rather than to just take away photographs from which to make these artworks. Here's our site, but before I get to it, um, I had mentioned to a friend that I wanted to find out where Eden was thought to be because I knew something awful would have happened there. A week later, she told me to turn on the 60 Minutes on 60 Minutes program, which was about Eden again, and it introduced my NGO Nature Rock and their restoration of the Mesopotamian marshes. It mentioned the enormous sewage problems that had arisen with the return of people to dry ground. I knew that a Wastewater Garden could clean that sewage and bring back the Garden of Eden. I got on the phone and found them. So before I um, tell you about the, the Wastewater Garden, I want you to know about the extraordinary Mesopotamian marshes of southern Iraq. To start at the beginning, um, the Babylonian creation myth, the Numa Elish, describes the beginning of the world as diffuse with only water, soon to be filled with reeds. This ancient legend, fit, fittingly described long ago, the landscape of the Mesopotamian marshes of southern Iraq, formed by eons of flood and drought along the Euphrates River. This is the Euphrates that you see here, in ideal form, made from this little photo, this little detail, of the river which is in, runs through the town of El Chabayish, where I work. The Euphrates is one of four sacred rivers, including the Tigris mentioned in the Bible and Quran, that intersected at the Garden of Eden. These, mon these marshes, once the largest wetlands in the Middle East and lar one of the few largest in the world, have been home to one of humanity's oldest cultures, that of the Marsh Arab. Known as the Medan, they lived off the resources of the marshes for thousands of years until its draining in the 1990s and terrible drought and high temperatures. The Medan are descendants of the earliest settlers in Mesopotamia, who formed the Sumerian culture over 6,000 years ago. These marshes lie within the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia, also known as the, the Cradle of Civilization. Um, so here you see in this, this middle column, it's, it'd be good to just point out that that's the ziggurat of Ur, at Ur, the ziggurat of Ur, that at the top is the temple to the moon god Nana, father of the important goddess Inanna, where she is. The Iraqi... Um, this piece is called Inanna of the Marshes. It's seven, six feet high on metal. Um, the Iraqi, my dear friend, Dr. Abdulamir al-Hamdani, recounted in 2013 the confluence of ancient traditions and those of his childhood along the Euphrates in the 1970s. Seasonal changes required villagers to prepare simultaneously for spring har harvest and the coming floods. His grandmother would paint red stars on his and livestock's foreheads, pointing to the morning star of Venus to, and saying, you better be careful or she's going to take you. Venus was the symbol of Inanna, the most powerful Sumerian goddess of fertility, war, and floods. The floods carried the seeds downstream to begin again. Here's another version of... Um, ooh, uh, oh, I put in the second version. Here's the second version of Inanna. This one's the Temple of Inanna. And here you see she's got on either, she's flanked by bullets. If you, In English, bullets and bullets, ancient bullets from Ur and bullet shells that were on the ground there. So here you can see about this, the ancient culture and the present and the past. Right in the middle at the top is a, is a contemporary reed meeting hall called the Mud Heath. And on this, um, on the left there, that's a very small cylinder seal, alabaster with a silver water buffalo on the top, 
and here it's been rolled out into a piece of clay. These were calling cards, a most amazing art form where people would engrave these small beads and wear them, and where, when they got to where they were going, they could roll out their invoice, a prayer, a social landscape, and here you can see this one that's rolled out as exactly the same architecture. And you'll see here in a minute the water buffalo that are, um, that are here in the marshes. Now right now, unfortunately, in this photo from 2022, they're starved and dehydrated because of the current drought. But in the 1990s, so before we get to the current drought, in the 1990s, the marshes were drained. Um, the dictator Saddam Hussein wanted to flush out Shia rebel hiding in the marshes to overthrow him. So he built secret roads. His engineers built secret roads into the marshes and then giant earthen canals to slowly drain the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates that feed the marshes into the Persian Gulf. Then once the waters were low enough, he could bomb, burn, burn, and drive out thousands. He turned the marshes into a charred graveyard and desert. What you see here is the town of Segal on the upper left by um, Nick Wheeler, um, a photograph um, of Segal. Um, one of the largest of the, of the villages with 50,000 people in 1977 living half on water on, on floating reed islands and half on land. And then in 2011, the upper left right is um, the, it, 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 the, the desert, charred desert. And below you can see the, the earthen canals that were breached once that Saddam Hussein was killed in the Mar Sheriff's return, breaking through the dikes with pickaxes. Now they were followed by um, Nature Rock. They were followed by Jassim al Asadi and Azam Alwash, who immediately returned to the marshes once Saddam was killed to create Iraq's first and only environmental NGO, Nature Rock, bringing in heavy equipment to break through the canals to let the water back in. So, what you see here in, um, in three columns in 2011 are the marshes partly restored by Nature Rock. You can see on the left them being 20% regreened with the water getting to that part, but on the right 80% still desertified. You can see if you can almost see the shells in the shells from the previous pictures on the ground and the Euphrates through that window there. So Nature Rock's work enabled the marshes and surrounding ancient sites of Iridu, Aruk, and Ur to become a World Heritage Site Nature Rock is our, our, is our sponsor in Iraq. So my first partner on the project, Mark Nelson, renowned environmental engineer, and Deborah Snyder, oh, um, I'm just noting them, that they were at this talk that I gave in Santa Fe. Um, but here what you see on this slide are um, a diagram on the left, which shows how our technology is, has a slight slope, new, new, no moving parts, a filter to maybe clean once a year, low cost compared to big public concrete project, water remediation projects. It's perfect for the marshes and perfect for the, the Middle East. Um, so what you see on the right is um, comparison between that drawing um, on the top of our site, our seven acre site, and the pipes that will go underground to bring the waste to these creation for our design embroidered Mesopotamian wedding blankets. That we that we were here. I'll go back again. That we actually were able to bring to um, Santa Fe's international folk art market. Iraq is the fifth country in the world most vulnerable to climate change. In our 12 years working here, we've seen the terrible result of this. The past few summers have had extraordinary high temperatures and drought combined with government mismanagement, prejudice against the South in favor of agriculture, the building of a hundred dams surrounding Iraq, withholding a promised water by international and national players. But as so, but as for us, as long as people are able to remain and there is sewage, our system works because it's underground. It's, it's not affected by climate change and it also functions as a carbon sink. So here I am, here are Mark, those are Mark Nelson's feet and, and on our first trip, 2011, we were, in, in 2011, our, our issue was having to find enough sewage to direct to a garden. But what we found, including no septic systems working in the whole country, that people were building on dry ground with sewage running openly in canals and through houses. Wait. Um, so a lot of meetings over the years, which I won't go into here, but I, I will say that it was really um, a challenge to be the only woman in this situation. And maybe sometimes it, it helped, I'm not sure. But here are meetings with men, with different, gov with the governors of our province, the minister of the environment on your right, with the 
uh, um, the Ministry of Water Resources, um, engineers on the top, um, was giving talks over and over again. And um, here is just to say something about how this project keeps going, has kept going um, for so many years. The first is just me on the right as an artist to let you know that when I first learned about um, the draining of the marsh of, of um, Eden in Iraq and the draining of the marshes by Saddam, Saddam Hussein, my, the family farm I was caretaking in Vermont, my neighbor had just drained our historic wetlands. Um, maliciously and surreptitiously. So I had just had that experience of my own home being somewhat destroyed. And here is my partner, Jocelyn Alasadi. Um, he's the managing director of Nature Rock, and he's a renowned engineer and environmental activist in Iraq. He's also a poet. He sings, he writes poetry, he dances, he's full of joy. And whenever everything had fallen through with all over the leads the ways that we were going to make this thing happen. He and I would get together in person and keep going. So, um, so Jossum is the spirit of the marshes, and it's um, once one of the largest in the world, and he's been responsible for its survival. He co-founded Nature Rock. He's an expert on environmental issues, water, and the protection of the Mesopotamian marshes. Oh, this is what I already said, but what I did want to say um, is that um, he just co-authored a book about his extraordinary life and relationship to environmental and political struggles in Iraq. Um, so, on January, on February 9th, I'm sorry, February 2nd, the Iraq Ministry of Water Resources and its Center for Restoration of Iraqi Marshes and Wetlands, CRIMS, began to move dirt at our seven-acre site in al Chabayish. After 12 years of amazing ups and downs, fallen governments, fallen budgets, sorts of oil crises, we have finally begun to build the first third of the Eden and the Rock Wastewater Garden at El Chabayash. We'll be able to clean by phytoremediation, um, that is, by plants, the sewage of 7,500 to 10,000 people in a city of 50,000. So here is the equipment moving in February 2nd. And right the, um, the day before this happened, we had our first real setback. Um, that um, Jossum had been kidnapped by an armed group. So for two weeks we were in suspended hell, um, just terrified about what could have happened to him. And lots of people work for his release. And um, I think the thing to say about this right now is he's fine, he's out, he's working again, and he hasn't been threatened by Islamicist, conservative, Iranian-backed militias that are so threatened by environmental workers. That's a whole other lecture about that. But he's back and we're working and the garden has started. So just to show you some pictures, here is our site where I've overlaid on, on the upper, see the upper image on the bank above the water. I've overlaid a side view of the garden and down below three views of, of the um, design features that we hope to build soon. Um, here's some, some more of those features. Um, and what you can see now, this is 3D imaging, so it's going to look a little um, more crafty. Um, but you can see we'll have shade structures, towers, um, wastewater cells, and all sorts of contrasting colors from floras. And, and in the design, let's see if it's here. It's not there, and it's not going to... Oh, here. Good. Here's the design on your right. What you see is we have a long, skinny site that's two ac seven acres, and the first almost three acres are just going to be a reed. Right now, this is what we're building is on your right, the lower part, just a reed bed. And you can see the wastewater cells, but you can see all these two, in the design, two rivulets come together and go down the center. And where they come together, they form a triangle where there'll be, some, um, there'll be herb gardens and a, a light work. But here I'm just showing, bringing in my own work right now. So I'm showing you the three things going on. The inspiration of the Mesopotamian embroidered wedding blankets, inspiring the garden design, and then also inspiring the artwork, where I was trying to mirror what was going on with the garden with, with um, textile works that, that are also function as tapestries. And here, here it's printed on linen in the middle of the amethyst room. Um, um, a, um, a, a dear Marsh, Marsh family's home. And what you see here is on top the marshes in full bloom sun. And here on the bottom, the desert is coming through. There's also a negative. I've inverted that picture. It's the background, so that always that that um, message that the marshes were losing the marshes they're they're drying out. We need people to give the water back that that was 
the promised water. And I've um, made a border on this piece of flora that I photographed at the um, Royal Botanic Garden in Jordan of plants that have been dated at least um, with, with um, DNA that's over 700 years old and, and therefore most likely could have um, existed. It's, it's flora that's mentioned in the Quran. It's ancient. And it's quite possible that it, it could have been in the, in the Garden of Eden. Um, here's a work um, called Eden Again, and these are tapestries that I had made in Belgium um, to honor the, the textile culture and traditions, the prayer rugs, the blankets everywhere. Um, and here again you see that picture of the marshes, 20% um, regreened and still just certified and in the middle, kind of a combination of the, the dates and the, the Euphrates. So it takes a lot of people to keep this project alive. And just to mention, we could start something like this. Mark and I started before we had any funding, but once I got a, a sizable research grant from my from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, we could um, actually put together an international team. And so here you see, you see two people in the center from that team, from Singapore and from um, Holland. Um, and then a first meetings with elected official meeting town councils, and here on the left, at, at that point, 2013, are, are um, two of my team, Davide Ticetto, Mark Nelson with Jossam, me, and two friends who were offering us um, the backyard of their, their shrine. And then as the team has expanded in, expanded in different groupings um, since 2019, and here in the center with our CRIM, our partners from the Ministry of Water Resources, who we're working with right now to actually be building, there, um, two of our team members went back with Jossam um, to the site in 2019, but it took until, no, sorry, 2021, they went, and finally 2023, we're beginning. And so on the right, here we are um, once a week. This is my heavy-duty group of engineers working on fundraising for the next $2 million that we need. And so the work has gone out. When There have been long periods when I couldn't be in Iraq, but I've shown the work um, various places. And so one place is the um, Currents New Media Festival. And this, these um, videos are online. When you go, you can see here, when you go into our website, Eden in Iraq, and you go to um, Outreach Exhibitions, you'll see that there's Currents, and you can play the video. Uh, and this is a video in the marshes, which is a four-track video on four, three walls on the floor that you can stand in and be in the midst of the boats and the water buffalo and singing and dancing. We also had a very big show in Singapore in 2017 of our whole design process and my artwork. And so there were kiosks with images and text. Here's our model. Oh, no, too fast. Um, but... Um, so this is also you can find on the website to go into the show. You can download all the photographs and the text. It's everything you ever wanted to know about Mesopotamia, about wastewater gardens, marshes, the three religions, our sources of institute. We actually tried to build in several sites before we finally began in El Chabayish. And here's our current site. Where, and this is what you could say currently, before we started to build, this is just pure sewage coming into the water. And those cows have... I want to talk... Um, Take a little deep breath right here. See if I'm finished there. I did. Um, what's next is in the fall of 2024. Um, I will be showing. We, I will be showing a collaborative project called the Boat as a Circle. So this is the newest work, and I'll just tell you a little bit, very little bit about it. Um, but early in March 2020, I was on my way to Sweden with my partner Ben for a year of projects. He to work on film projects and me um, to go on to Iraq where we thought we had we were funded. And then COVID hit. So three days after arriving in Sweden, we were told to stay inside. The Swedes locked down everybody over 70, while everyone else went about their business outside unmasked and in groups. So it wasn't so safe for us to even go outside. I reached out to an old Santa Fe friend, American artist Joanne Grunyanov, who, is now, who now lives in Sweden. And so she took me under a wing to get me out of my double isolation of knowing hardly anyone in this foreign country, as well as the isolating fear that permeates a lockdown situation. We talked weekly by phone and emailed letters back and forth with little image studies generated from what we were saying. The only trouble was I had no um, photo images to work with, so, the first, so for the first time I had to make things up. 
I'd been reading a remarkable book by British archaeologist Dr. Irving Frankel called The Ark Before Noah, the decoding, the sto- decoding the Story of the Flood. And I'd been thinking possibly this flood, flood story could expand my work in Iraq since it appeared that Noah's place of origin was the marshes. As I read passages from the book to Joanne, it quickly became apparent that we were in the midst of our own flood story. COVID was raging around the planet, mirroring so many extinctions already in process because of rampant growth, unstable democracies, and climate change. We linked our process to the flood story before Noah from the Gilgamesh epic, the first Western extinction story, and and we linked it with, with the climate emergency in mind. In this story, Utnapishni is a character, Utnapishni is the prime character, Noah. He's warned by the god Enki to prepare for a flood that will wipe out all life. The gods have decided to destroy all living beings for their incessant chatter. Enki, still fond of humans, whispers through a reed wall to tell Utnapishni how to build a round boat to escape the coming deluge. He must gather two of, two of all beings to replenish the earth. And for us, the flood story was our story as well. So we made an artist book of our own process called The Boat as a Circle with hope of enlarging the ideas we traded back and forth into future artworks. And here are two pages from our chapter, which was recently published in Dark Mountain Journal's book called The Ark. It was published in the UK last fall and, and, and was taken from our artist book. So you could probably stop the, um, my talk right here if you wanted and read our letters back and forth. And so two more pages. Um, um, and here we're, so just remember about COVID um, and, you know, that remember about COVID time that we really were locked up and here she and I are on the phone talking about this to girls and we're remembering, we're, we're imagining if we have to do all, do this alone, is this boat that we want to, um, so I didn't actually say this very well, but what we try to do is we, we basically co- commandeer a, let me, yeah, um, we in our in our letters back and forth, we co um, we come co woman. I, co- I say we co womandeered a boat, and what we do is we take this boat through all sorts of possibilities of how we're going to survive extinction. And at one point, with this image that you're seeing, we're wondering if we have to do this alone, or how can we get other people to join us? And right, we're we're white. We're not we're not of color. You know, how are we going to intersect with everything that's happening? So here's some of the images that I've been working on. Um, oh, what I do want to say here about these images before I talk about them is that PBS made a film about Dr. Finkel's book called The Real Noah's Ark in 2013, and they had a boat made to scale in India. Blink Films kindly gave, has given me permission, has given me a high-resolution image file that was used in, you know, of that boat that they built to use, to use of the coracle. So... Um, I think I didn't say emphatically enough that when Utnapishni tells Noah, when God Enki tells Utnapishni to build the boat, he tells him to make it of equal dimensions, a circular boat. Um, The boat's a circle, it's not a church-shaped ark. Um, So um, that for us was such an amazing symbol and also a message about which direction do you go in. So in thinking about making... um, so I began to work with this boat, and um, being in Sweden with no images of my own, um, my dear friend Joan Myers, an incredible photographer, who bravely went to Antarctica 20 years ago, gave me permission to use parts of some of her photographs that to contain glaciers and ice flows. And so what I wanted to do was put this boat through all the, the impending weather and situations that are going to happen to us. And so... But of course, where there's melt, there's also fire. The increase in moisture traps heat. So as temperatures rise, we also see the oncoming oncoming drought in at least half the world. For so many in New Mexico, the deluge is a a drought or fire. New Mexico, where I live now. So I've worked on this boat with this boat for almost a year and a half, and it's now an an alter ego. So here are two of them: the deluge and the um, drought is um, flood. Um, they are on canvas. They're printed with the help of my amazing assistant, Marsha Reifman, because I had to talk, I had to learn Photoshop at age 74, 3. Um, so they're, they are, um, 
edited their composite images. Some are my images, some are Joan's um, and, the, and the Coracle. And um, they're edited, montaged together. And they are on canvas, they are printed on canvas so that they can hang 70, about six feet high. Here are two more. Um, one is the backyard boat and the other is boat as a garden. And so this has to do with what we were thinking as we were locked down in Sweden. Do, do we get out? What do we do? Don't we have to come home? And remember those days of COVID where you just wanted to run away. And so, but the real issue now is to stay put and to become as sustainable, as resilient, as humanly possible to take our footprints off of the planet. So here is how they look um, when they're up on the wall. Um, slightly smaller print than I'm making now, but it gives you an idea of how they hang. And then also these circles. I'm working on um, a piece that I think it's called Regermination. It's going through a lot of different um, manifestations, but these are some of the images that are about reseeding, regerminating, flood from drought. What can we do to be resilient? And what do we need to learn to build soil, dikes, clear brush, plant trees, collect wastewater, grow food, replant roots? So Joanne is an amazing artist, and she, she um, draws, she paints, she sculpts, she performs. She's quite a performance artist, and she has an alternative persona, Cassandra, who is often seen in Stockholm wearing all these pollinator gadgets of, of eggshells and wings and um, butterfly wings and feathers. And during COVID, during the time I knew her, I was in Sweden, that is, every day she made a video of somebody trying to fly. Now the other thing we both were doing, uh oh, where am I? Um, is that we both make we both are now with the boat as a circle project. We're both making mirrors, and her mirrors are are really from real earthy earthy. We think ahead of ourselves to future generations, or just attend to the moment. So maybe so. What will you take if you're thinking ahead? Many of us will want to stay on the shore and just watch it all unfold. Or maybe some of us will take the lead to rebuild and regerminate. So I'm asking people, what species and perils will we help to save when we have to get in the boat? And so here are some of those things. Uh oh, some of those um, things that people have told me over time, as I'm learning to kind of refine my questions. To have, and I've gotten to the point where I want people to think ahead. Originally, it was just, what will you take with you? But what, what? What now? Let's think ahead. What can we take that will allow our species to continue and all the other species so that we are not the keystone species? So um, if you have any ideas, you can write me um, and I'll keep you posted about this new work. And thank you for watching and listening.